Good morning. Welcome to the Presbyterian Church of Willingboro on this gray last day of October. It is, of course, Halloween, and we are grateful to Cecilia for showing the colors this morning. I want to highlight a couple of announcements as we get started today. Um, we will try Bible study again this week at 1.30 on Tuesday. There will be a Zoom link that is sent out if you are around at 1.30 on Tuesday. We would love to have you join us. I know that uh, most of us are out and about and doing the, the business of our day, but if you are available, give it a try. Stop on by at 1.30. And um, maybe we can have some conversation. Next Sunday is All Saints Sunday. Tomorrow is All Saints Day, the first Sunday, the first day of November. Uh, we will celebrate it next Sunday on our Communion Sunday in November. We have here at uh, the Presbyterian Church of Willingboro. Uh, we will have some special music. We will have a reading of the names of those who have been lost over the past two years. We're going to do two years. And so I would very much appreciate it if those of you who are listening at home and those of you who are here today, if you would send those names either to me or to Wendy so that we have them, so that we can put together what we call a necrology, a list of those. They do not have to be members of the church. Many of you have lost members of your family or good friends over the last two years, and we would like to light a candle for them as well. So please let me know if you will be here in worship next Sunday. Of course, you may light the candle yourself. If not, I will be happy to light candles for you. So um, I hope that you will help us, help me in particular, as I don't know many of you. Um, well enough, I was not here over the past few years, so I don't know the circumstances of your lives, but I would be very, very, very touched if you would trust me with um, remembering your loved ones next Sunday. We will also have some lovely music. We will have some, um, we'll have some special readings and a special uh, All Saints Day uh, sermon for next week. If you saw in the announcements uh, that were sent out to you both on Friday and then also as attached to the Zoom link for this Sunday, um, there is a, a graph in the announcements on our finance progress. It comes from our financial committee, and it will be in the announcements every week. So if you wish to take note of how we are doing toward our goals during 2021, please do take note of that graph that is in our announcements page. Now, yes, it's very small. <laughs> it is very small. I worked at making it a little larger when I was putting together the announcements and I didn't quite make it. So I think you can expand that on your computer if you look at it there rather than in a printed version. I'll do, try to do best, better next week. At this time, I would invite you to greet one another here in the pew and on Zoom with a sign of peace. You might stand, wave, do your happy dance hands. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, forever you had formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Please join me in the call to worship. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. From everlasting to everlasting, you are our God. Satisfy us in the morning, O God, with your steadfast love. Let us, Let us rejoice and be glad all our days. Let us, Let us worship God. God. As you worship in the, in the pews, please feel free to open the book, follow along with the words, or hum along. Thank you.
join me in the prayer of confession. If the Lord should keep account of sin, who could stand? But with God there is forgiveness, and we can trust in God's mercy. Let us therefore confess our sins before God and our neighbor. Let us pray together. God of forgiveness, grant us your favor as we make our confession. You call us to excellence. We fall short of your confidence in us. You grant us grace. We abuse your gift. You expect our decisions to match your desires, our love to be genuine in obeying your will. Yet we trust our will rather than rely on your goodness. We look to our comfort rather than to our neighbor's need. In Christ, have mercy on us and forgive our sin. Let us now continue to confess our sin in the silence of our hearts. Friends, we are God's children, loved, accepted, and forgiven. We are welcomed home again and again. Friends, hear and believe the good news of God. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. They meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. Lord God, prosper us in the hearing and the doing of your word. Amen. Our scripture it comes today from First Kings. This is not a book that we hear from very often. It is included in the Precise Common Lectionary very rarely. This, this scripture reading this morning comes from Will Gaffney's Lectionary for the Whole World. It's a, a wonderful guide for your reading and is available if you should choose to take a look at it on Amazon or anywhere else that the books are sold. Let us now listen to the word of God. King David was old and advanced in years. And although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. So his servants said to him, let a young virgin be sought for my lord the king and let her wait on the king and be his attendant. Let her lie in your bosom so that my lord the king may be warm. So they searched for a beautiful girl throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishai, the Shunammite, and they brought her to the king. The girl was very beautiful. She became the king's attendant and served him, but the king did not know her sexually. Then Nathan said to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, have you not heard that Adonijah, son of Haggath, has become king, and our Lord David does not know it? Now therefore come, let me give you advice, so that you may save your own life 
and the life of your son, Solomon. Go in at once to King David and say to him, Did you not, my lord the king, swear to your servant, saying, Your son Solomon shall succeed me as king, and he shall sit on my throne. Why then is Adonijah king? Then while you are still there speaking with the king, I will come in after you and confirm your words. So Bathsheba went to the king in his room. The king was very old. Abishai the Shunammite was attending the king. Bathsheba bowed and did obeisance to the king, and the king said, What do you wish? She said to him, My lord, you swore to your servant by the Lord your God, saying, Your son Solomon shall succeed me as king, and he shall sit on my throne. But now, suddenly, Adonijah has become king, though you, my lord, the king, do not know it. King swore, saying, as the Lord lives, who has saved my life from every adversity, as I swore to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, your son Solomon shall succeed me as king, and he shall sit on my throne in my place. So will I do this day. Then Bathsheba bowed her face to the ground and did obeisance to the king and said, may my Lord King David live forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a lot more to the story. It's long. Take a look when you get a chance. First Kings chapter one. My enduring memory of childhood Sunday school is the heroes of the Old Testament coloring book. But to a kid's mind, anyway, it was the cornerstone of the Presbyterian second grade curriculum. I have no memory of any teachers. None of the Bible verses that we were supposed to have committed to memory. No enduring lessons, none, beyond the weird insistence that Jesus cared about whether or not I had made my bed. An insistent that led me even at eight to suspect that I wasn't getting the full poop on this Christian thing. But heroes of the Old Testament in the 72 colors available in a 60s era box of crayons imprinted on my heart and soul forever. <laughs> I remember Abraham and his long white beard, Joseph, of course, with the coat that utilized all 72 of those colors, Moses looking every bit like Charlton Heston, redesigned for the pre-puberty set, Samson replete with biceps and ringlets, and David, of course, David, the shepherd boy in the fields with his flocks, David, the young warrior, with his slingshot standing over the body of the giant. David, the beautiful and powerful king, with his hair as yellow as the grain in the fields and eyes of crystal blue. What I don't remember is the David of our story this morning. This is not an attractive picture of the king upon whom the eternal mantle of God rested. Not a good look for a tear out put up on the fridge, second grade Sunday school coloring page. Old, weak, impotent, horribly vulnerable, so fragile and inert that his court conspires to find him the most beautiful virgin in the country and bring her to him. Apparently, even the womanizing David, who ran around the kingdom chasing after women and usually catching them whether they liked it or not, even that would be better than this shell of a man drooling and stumbling his way toward death. 
The kingdom, you see, was in peril. Rivals had tried rebellion before when David was at his prime, and they were sure to try again now, and they did. David's eldest son took one look at his father and said, okay then, this isn't working. I guess I'll be king. And why not? Adonijah was a striking figure of a man. He was handsome, the most handsome in the world, brave, vital, and always helpful, super ambitious. And next in line for the throne, David's second born after the beloved Absalom, who had died fighting his father for the throne. Adonijah was exactly the kind of man that you and I might have picked to follow David. There is no doubt, my friends, that there would have been a page for him in the Heroes of the Old Testament coloring book. But Adonijah was never going to be king because just as the son was organizing his administration into the story waltz living ghosts from David's past. Nathan, the prophet who spoke God's word of condemnation after David had killed Uriah. Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, whom David had taken simply because he could. And Solomon, Bathsheba's baby boy, who would one day become the king. Confused yet? <laughs> I know, it's complicated. And it's a little absurd, really. A tragic comic opera worthy of Gilbert and Solomon. Nathan whispering in Bathsheba's ear, Bathsheba, David's queen, whispering in David's ear, while ignoring the beautiful maiden snuggled up with David on the bed. And then Nathan popping into the bedroom, too, just to make sure his plot to install Solomon on the throne was going as he had planned it to. And then there's David, of course, weak, old, stumbling, a little foggy in memory, putting on his crown one more time to publicly agree that although he couldn't quite remember doing it, of course he had promised the throne to the last, the youngest, and the most unlikely of all his children, Solomon. It isn't really all that surprising and that this little scene never made it into my old coloring book or into the revised common lectionary for preaching either. With its palace intrigue and the scent of corruption that hangs over it, with its portrait of a feeble-minded old man manipulated by his sons, by his courtiers, by his holy man, and by his queen, with no obvious sign of God anywhere, it is a thoroughly unattractive, even nasty picture of the man whose house and lineage runs all the way from that bedroom to the baby in a manger in Bethlehem. So why, you ask, is this narrative here? Why did the ancients who wrote down these stories include this one that reflects so badly on their beloved anointed king. I'm glad you asked. As I may have mentioned once before or twice, one of my favorite seminary professors maintained that the Bible is indeed God's word to us about God. And it is also, he would say, God's word to us about us. This picture of power and its exercise is God's word to us about us. And it's a familiar word. Tales of backroom deals at the highest levels of government and the corrupt brokering of influence and access of status and position fill 
our media. Even in our own lives, we know that families sometimes argue and break over what grandpa left behind. Backbiting and betrayal are not the exclusive province of the rich and the powerful. God's word to us and our us. But it is also God's word to us about God, about who God is and who God loves and who God uses for his purposes. Even though we don't hear the name of God spoken here, except as an oath, God is in this, working in and through these broken people, in and through his prophet, who once spoke powerfully the word of God, in and through his anointed one who now fades in the fog of extreme old age, and in and through the wife of Uriah, so badly used. By David. The first gospel of the New Testament begins, you probably know this, it begins with the lineage of Jesus the Messiah, Matthew says, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew, who sees salvation as an ark, beginning back before the dawn of time. Matthew does not let us look away from the down in the dirt humanity of the genealogy of our Lord. It is right there in the gospel in black and white. Matthew would have us believe that without the rape of Bathsheba, without the murder of Uriah, there would be no Solomon to sit on the throne of David. And without the wife of Uriah, there would be no Jesus, no son of David, son of God. You and I are super comfortable with the fully divine Savior who sits at the right hand of God and never gets his hands dirty. We love the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus from Minnesota who cast his eyes away from the gritty humanity we own and upwards toward heaven and is so holy that he glows. I don't know the picture I'm talking about, right? It's in every Sunday school room in America. We're also fully on board with the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. But the fully human Jesus with dirty feet that need washing before he sits down to eat. The Jesus who gets tired and irritated with his friends. The Jesus who bangs his head against the wall in frustration at the willful blindness he encounters. The Jesus who eats enough to be called a glutton, who drinks enough to be accused of insobriety. The Jesus with nowhere to lay his head the Jesus who weeps over Lazarus and bleeds on the cross as he dies. That Jesus, that's much. And yet this is the Jesus whom God gave us, the Jesus who saves us, the Jesus who knows us and loves us anyway, the Jesus who is descended from a rapist and a murderer through the life of Uriah. And this is the good news. This is. This is the good news that Matthew proclaims at the beginning of the New Testament. This is the good news of God for each one of us, that the brokenness of our humanity is gathered up into the Savior that God sent to bring us back to the heart of God. That the Savior that God sent us is one of us with heartbreak and pain and betrayal in his DNA. God sent a Savior who knows us and loves us and will save us because although our Lord is God, he is also us. Fully human, 
through the wife of Uriah, fully human, just like you and me. We're not good enough. We've made a mess of our lives. We're divorced. We're never married. We can't hold on to a job. We're failures at adulting. We drink, we smoke, we eat too much. We're drowning in debt. We're old, we're young. We're poor, we're tired, we're sad. We're sinners. We've broken promises. We can't figure out how to fix ourselves. We've given up even trying. How could God ever use folks like us? Why would he? Maybe someplace in all those words, you hear your own voice and you despair. Well, don't, just don't. Remember my friends that God loved David despite it all. God chose David for his own and with all that David was, young, old, poor, sad, tired, sinner. And through David, by the wife of Uriah, God gave us Jesus. If David was good enough for God, dear ones, so are you. Let us pray. Holy God, it is so hard sometimes to see us in the heroes of the Old Testament, to see ourselves and these ones who seem so perfect. Thank you for the gift of this story, the gift of the old and tired David, the gift of the Nathan who sneaks around behind David's back, the good gift of Bathsheba, who knew such pain in her life. Thank you for this story, for in it, maybe we do see a little bit of ourselves in the rejoice. It is in Jesus' name that we pray this and all things. Amen. My friends, it is at this time that we will confess the faith of the church. For the next couple of weeks, we will be using a portion of the newest confession of the PCUSA, the Confession of Belhar, which is a confession that was written during the time of apartheid in South Africa as a response to a government that claimed to own the church. This was the response of the South African church. People of God, let us say what we believe. We believe that God has revealed himself as the one who wishes to bring about justice and true peace among people. That God in a world full of injustice and enmity is in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wronged. That God calls the church to follow him in this. For God brings justice to the oppressed and gives bread to the hungry, that God frees the prisoner and restores sight to the blind, that God supports the downtrodden, protects the stranger, helps orphans and widows, and blocks the path of the ungodly, that for God, pure and undefiled religion is to visit the orphans and the widows in their suffering, that God wishes to teach the church to do what is good and to seek the right, that the church must therefore stand by people in any form of suffering and need, which implies, among other things, that the church must witness against and strive against any form of injustice, so that justice may roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream that the church as the possession of God must stand where the Lord stands 
namely against injustice and with the wrong, that in following Christ, the church must witness against all the powerful and privileged who selfishly seek their own interests and thus control and harm others. Amen. At this time, I would like to invite Deacon Angie Alexander to come forward and share with us what this church, this Willingboro Presbyterian Church, means to her. Good morning. Good morning. Um, why PCW? Um, my son Quentin first came to this church. Angie, on. You just get your butt that closer to your mouth so we can hear you a little better. Oh, okay. Thank Is you. Is that better? That's much better. Thank you. Oh, okay. I had to write it down because I'm not good at all the tough stuff. <laughs> my son Quentin came to this church on a scout Sunday while I was away from military duty. When I came home, he told me about the church and that he wanted to visit again. When we did, we felt very welcome. People remembered him, and I was touched and felt so good about the experience. He joined the church, and I did a couple of years later. And I remember thinking how inclusive the congregation was. The church was having a yard sale, and I came out to help with the donations the night before. And uh, Richard Wright asked if I wanted to help on the property committee. That was even before I joined. Um, I found a new family here. Uh, Richard and Renee, Curtis and Gwen, Afyon Utah, Joyce and Kristen Ball, Abby Harper and her parents. Rita and Earl Richards were very nice to me when I first came. I think we still make an effort to stay that way, even through all the changes that we've been through. And I'm proud to say I'm, I belong here. That's it. It is now that time of the program that we would like to uh, have the offerings of the people. They're uh, here at the uh, sanctuary. There is a uh, plate at the back of the sanctuary. Uh, do not do it now. Nobody will come around either. Uh, if you could drop it off on your way out. Uh, those of you on Facebook or Zoom, if you would like to make donations, uh, donations can be made through the Banco mobile app here at the church by mail at 494 February Rancocas Road or on the church's website at presbychurchwillingworld.org. Thank you. 
toward your will. We thank you for the saints of this church who have continued to be open and warm and inclusive even during this difficult time of pandemic. And we thank you for those who are willing to step forward and remind us all of what it was that brought us here and what it is that keeps us here. We thank you for the generous hearts that you have created in these people and we ask that you would continue to lift them up lift us up that we might remember that all that we have and all that we are belongs to you and then return a portion of that with thanksgiving it is in jesus name that we pray amen we do come now to our time of joys and concerns I did want to lift up one joy. I am hoping that Kathy is watching from home. Some of you may know that Kathy's mom had surgery this week. She did not, in the end, need to have a bed replacement. She had, uh, they were able to repair the bone. So we give thanks to God for that. My guess is that Kathy is at home taking care of her. But tomorrow is Kathy's birthday. So Cecile, do you think we could play happy birthday to Kathy? And you all just come on, a few bars or clap. Concerns, please know that we are in prayer for you and we continue to pray for God's peace and God's guidance in your lives. We do have a, another tremendous joy this morning. We got a, a letter from the Willingboro Public Schools. On behalf of the Willingboro Public Schools, I would like to personally thank you and the Presbyterian Church of Willingboro for the generous donation of winter coats, hats, and gloves for the students of the Willingboro Public Schools. Your generosity is greatly appreciated and will serve as a blessing to our families. Sincerely, Dr. Neely Hackett. Thanks to all of you. I think we'll pat on the back would be appropriate. You guys did a great job. Well done. And well done to our deacons who spearheaded this. We are grateful for their continuing grace. <laughs> Too many papers here, I'm afraid. At this time, let us bring all of our joys, all of our concerns before the Lord who listens to our prayers and comes. Awesome God, we sing for joy to you, for you are our strength. We come in joy to worship you, God, for you are our ever-present strength. Before the mountains were put forth, or the seas began to flow, from everlasting to everlasting, you are our God. God of every season, hear now our prayer. We pray for those who cannot laugh and for those who cannot cry. We pray for those who cannot care and for those who are overwhelmed by their worries. We pray for those who cannot work and for those who can't seem to find time to relax. We pray for those who cannot talk before they are, because they are afraid no one will listen. And for those who cannot stop talking because they are afraid that no one has heard them. 
For those who cannot give love, O oh God, we pray. For those who cannot accept love, we pray as well. For those who are tired of living and afraid of dying, and those who are eager to live, but are faced with the reality of death. We lift all these up before you, God, and we lift up to you too our nation and its leaders and all of those who seek to lead. Lord God, so many speak your name and yet forget what it is that you have asked of your people. Grant to them and to us the grace and the wisdom to remember, to praise your holy name and to walk together with you faithfully and humbly, doing justice, loving kindness, always working for peace. We lift up before you too, O oh God, our church. Grant us the grace and the humility to walk with you, to be who you are in the world. We lift up before you, O oh God, our families and our friends. Grant us the grace to make known your love in every relationship that we have. Make real to us, O oh God, this world of suffering people, some who are far away and others as close as our own neighborhoods, some with life experiences like our own and others with experiences we can scarcely imagine. Lead us by your grace to reach out and to touch those whom we meet in their places of need with your compassionate love as we have been touched in ours. God of every season, we give you thanks that you are our God, and we pray these and all things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now join our hearts in a hymn of confident faith. <laughs>
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be yours this day and forevermore. Amen.